Africa has welcomed the sixth assessment by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The assessment report is the first in a series of reports to be adopted under the IPCC sixth assessment cycle. The report highlights and analyzes the, in the detail available in terms of climate change in southern Africa. More than uh, more on this, uh, we're joined by the Minister of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, uh, Minister Barbara Creasy. Minister, pleasure having you on the program. Welcome to the agenda. Thank you very much. Good morning and uh, greetings, greetings to all your viewers. So what does the sixth assessment report say about climate change in Southern Africa in particular? Well, I think overall the report finds that we are on track, unfortunately, to achieve a 1.5 degree centigrade average global increase in temperature within the next 20 years, unless we take very strong mitigating action. Mm. Now for Southern Africa, what we've known for some time is that this region is warming up at twice the global rate. Um, if the report says that we have already globally achieved an average temperature increase of 1.1 degrees, it means that here in Southern Africa, we've already achieved a temperature increase of 2.2 degrees on average. Mm. And uh, what we already know this means is increased episodes of prolonged drought, um, a drying out mm. of the region in general, extreme weather events, um, tropical cyclones, extreme storms, but also the increasing frequency of very severe wildfires. Right. And I think that uh, we, we are all experiencing this, so we know that, in fact, from our yeah. own lived experience, it is true. Yeah, that, that's not uh, in, uh, in the future. It's, it's happening right now. We're we reporting on wildfires around the world. Uh, currently, the report, I understand, states that, as you mentioned, droughts will become more frequent at 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, Celsius of global warming, and more so as the level of global warming increases. I guess the question, Minister, is what can we do about it? Well, I think that where we can draw hope is that the report says it's not too late to avoid the 1.5 degree average temperature increase, uh, which is expected to occur in the next 20 years. It's not too late. But what it means is that all countries, our own included, have to take action immediately to reduce uh, our, our carbon gas emissions. But also over the longer term, we have to commit to a mid-century target of net zero and uh, creating climate re resilient societies. So the, the ultimate aim is to, I guess, get to a point where we can call ourselves uh, climate resilient society. Uh, but I guess, Minister, transitioning to a low carbon economy, it, it comes with a lot of pushback, maybe, from, from some uh, role players. What sort of pushback are you getting from industry and, and I guess from society in general? Well, I think where we've got to start is by understanding that South Africa, although we only contribute 1% to global emissions, mm. we are in the top 20 uh, carbon gas emitters in the world. And therefore, there is a lot of focus on the choices that we're going to be making over the next decade. Um, the, the major part of our emissions comes from our power generation. And I think we can draw strength from the fact that ESCOM itself has indicated a willingness to achieve net carbon zero by 2050. Mm. Of course, the, the issue is the speed at which we are going to decommission our coal-fired power stations. We already have several that are reaching the end of their lives. But a, a major issue that we have to look at is how are we going to provide employment and livelihoods for those communities that are primarily in Mpumalanga who are totally dependent at this stage on the coal value chain. There's some very interesting socioeconomic research that ESCOM has been doing, looking uh, on the one hand at what are the risks 
and, and how many jobs are actually at risk. And on the other hand, looking at whether it's possible to repurpose power stations so that we can save the direct jobs, but through developing other industries in the area, also address the question of the indirect jobs. Yeah. Now, when you talk about the question of pushback, I think that what is really important is President Ramaphosa's Presidential Climate Commission. This brings together civil society, organized labor, business and government. And together, we are researching and identifying pathways that can lead us to this mid-century commitment of net zero. South Africa, I understand, will be submitting its uh, revised nationally determined contribution to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions uh, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change ahead of uh, COP26. Uh, what are some of the, the changes, Minister, you will be submitting? Look, we, we're still in the process. The original proposal that we put out for public comment saw us bring forward our peak plateau decline trajectory by 10 years. So we're now saying we will begin our, our decline in carbon emissions in 2025, not in 2035, as was originally the case. Secondly, the proposal we put out has said that um, we aim to reduce emissions by 27% by 2030. Now, the Climate Commission has proposed uh, more ambitious targets, and I think that what we have been doing together with our partners is looking at the modelling and looking at whether the targets that have been proposed by the Climate Commission are achievable and what impact they would have on the economy and on jobs. We do aim to finalise that work ahead of Glasgow in November. And of course, we will be then submitting our revised NDCs. Uh, what about developed countries, Minister? Are developed countries playing their part? Are they, they honouring what some you know, call their obligation uh, to provide financial support to developing countries uh, who are already, you know, as we've been talking about, facing the impact of climate change? I wish I could say that they were. But I think that one of the areas that created considerable mistrust when we went to Madrid is the fact that um, as yet there is no transparency about the extent to which the developed countries have honoured their initial commitment to raise 100 billion per annum mm. by 2020. Um, there's also no clarity whether this commitment will continue until 2025. And uh, nobody's saying anything about the period post-2025. Mm. Now, why this is serious is that the OECD estimates that over the next 15 years, developing countries will require in the region of three to four trillion US dollars in order to climate-proof their built infrastructure, transition their economies, make agriculture, um, agricultural changes to enhance their food security and so on and so forth. We proposed when we went to the recent um, climate ministers meeting in the UK, called by Minister Alok Sharma, who's the incoming COP president, we proposed that developing countries should commit in the post 2025 era to a floor of 100 billion US dollars per annum, moving towards 750 million billion US dollars by 2030. And obviously um, not all of this would be, it definitely wouldn't all be grant financing. It wouldn't all come from governments. Uh, it would also include the private sector, but, but these are the kinds of numbers that we're talking about. If developing countries such as our own and many much poorer countries are going to be able to achieve their adaptation targets and also their mitigation targets. Important conversations, no doubt. The impact is being felt. Uh, we thank you, Minister, for coming on, explaining the sixth assessment by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's an important contribution, I guess, to enhance scientific understanding on climate change. Minister, thank you very much indeed for breaking it down. Be well. Thank you. All right, Minister.